A lot of us come from the school of thought that if there's no pain, then there's no gain. If we're not getting sore or if we're not in a little bit of pain during a workout, then we're not getting stronger. Or we're not growing from it. I want to address that in this video and I have to you know, be honest. I mean, I talk about stressors a lot and I talk about things with fasting or things with workouts Then, if you're not exposing yourself to a little bit of stress then you have nothing to adapt to, right? You have to always be pushing yourself to a little bit of a stressful point if you want to grow from it. But does that mean that we really need to be getting ourselves brutally sore in order to grow from a workout? Does soreness equate muscle growth or gains? Well, let's break it down in this video. You are tuned into the internet's leading performance, nutrition, and fat loss channel. New videos every single Tuesday, Friday, and Sunday at 7 a.m. Pacific time, and a bunch of other videos peppered in throughout the rest of the week. I wanna make sure you hit that subscribe button and make sure you hit that bell button to turn on notifications so you know whenever I go live. And also, I wanna make sure you check out my keto and fasting Thrive box. Okay, so Thrive Market has made it so that you can get your groceries literally cheaper than you would at the grocery store without ever having to leave your house. Literally just a couple clicks of a button. And they've been gracious enough to allow me to create some awesome boxes for my friends, my fans, and of course, those that are watching my videos. So click on the link down below in the description. Now, let's get into some muscle soreness science. Okay, so delayed onset muscle soreness. It's that soreness that you feel after a good workout. Whenever you train harder, you typically feel this delayed onset muscle soreness. So that leads us to believe that if you're training harder and you're getting more sore, that more soreness means you're making results, right? You're getting results. Well, that may not be the case. You see, there's a couple of things that people think delayed onset muscle soreness is. Number one, they think that it's just the cellular trauma, right? It's just the fact that we're breaking down muscle fibers and we're getting sore because of that. Well, that could be the case, but science is starting to show that's not really what's happening. The other thing that people address a lot is, well, it's a lactic acid accumulation. Okay, when we work out, you feel that lactic acid burn, right? Like if you were to go and you were to run a bunch of stairs, your quads might start to burn. That's lactic acid, and all that really is is causing a pretty acidic environment. It's causing an influx of hydrogen ions that are making your muscle pretty acidic. And what ends up happening is eventually your body has to neutralize that. That doesn't make you sore for the long term. That makes you have that soreness and that burn temporarily and the body flushes it out and that lactate goes through the Cori cycle and gets reconverted back into energy and you're back to square one. So that's not really the case either. But there is some evidence of hydrogen ions along with reactive oxygen species, which are just like free radicals and things like that, contributing to a small degree of muscle soreness, but nothing to really write home about. Some of the other theories behind muscle soreness are going to be cellular membrane damage, like where we're actually damaging a cell. You know, we're tearing down muscle fibers, but we're really actually damaging a cell. And that cellular damage is causing a little bit of a painful response. Okay, I mean, that's a decent theory and that makes sense. And there's some science to back that up. And then of course, there's the actual inflammatory response theory, where we are literally triggering so much damage to an area that we are causing cytokines to trigger inflammation to one specific part of the body. We've all had those workouts before where like you actually feel swollen in a given area. Like you went out and you ran a bunch after you haven't been running for a long time and suddenly your legs are swollen and you have some localized edema and swelling. That could definitely contribute to some overall soreness. But the fact is a lot of us don't know where delayed onset muscle soreness comes from. But there are some interesting studies that are coming out that show that it doesn't necessarily constitute progress with your overall strength and size. So this first study that I want to reference was published in the journal Physiology. Took a look at eight subjects. Okay, and these eight subjects, they had them conduct 210 repetitions with their leg with a voluntary movement on one leg and electrically stimulated or electrically induced contraction on the other leg. So basically with one leg, they did leg extensions. The other leg, they were connected to some kind of electrical device that caused a contraction, an eccentric contraction. Basically caused the muscle to flex and relax. So what they wanted to determine here was what kind of cellular damage would actually occur given each situation and which one had soreness and which one didn't. Well, the results were pretty darn interesting. So they saw that cellular damage occurred in both groups, but there was more specific cellular damage in the electrically induced contraction group. But when you start diving into the data even more, you found that only the electrically induced contraction group actually had pain. So then when you cross-reference everything, you look at the different kind of cells that were broken down and the damage that occurred, you found that the electrically induced contraction group ended up having damage to the cells in the connective tissue in between the muscle fibers. So we have these long muscle fibers in our muscles, right? 
Well, they kind of bind together parallel with each other. But there's actually connective tissue that binds these together. So we think of connective tissue as just the tissue that connects a muscle to a bone or a muscle to a muscle, things like that. But the fact is, like in between the individual muscle fibers, we have connective tissue. And believe it or not, the nerve endings, where we actually have that nerve response and that pain response, is actually in that connective tissue. So what they found is that there was actual cellular damage inside the connective tissue in between the muscles. And that is what was leading to the pain. You see, the overall cellular damage to the actual muscle level was about the same between the two groups. But it was different with the electrically stimulated group because they are actually able to damage the connective tissue, probably because there wasn't the psychosomatic effect. You know, for example, if you're voluntarily doing an exercise, you have a mental aspect that's going to shut you off before you go too far, right? Whereas with an electrically stimulated result, you're not going to have that control. Like that's just electrically contracting your muscle beyond your brain's control. So it's like if someone goes and they take a supplement that's going to allow them to push it beyond their mental threshold, they have a higher likelihood of getting sore, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the muscle is growing, which leads me into this next research piece. So this study was published in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. It wanted to take a look at more of a high frequency training regime versus a lower frequency training regime. So essentially what they did is they said, okay, one group of people is going to go ahead and they're going to train one muscle group per day. So basically at the end of the week, they will have obliterated their chest one day, their shoulders one day, their back one day, et cetera, et cetera. The other group, they said, we want you to hit every single body part every single day, but at a lower volume. Okay, so every muscle group every day versus one muscle group per day. But at the end of the week, they had all done the same amount of reps and the same amount of sets. It was just one group did a little bit every day and the other group just demolished one muscle group every single day. So here's what they found. Okay, the group that demolished individual muscle groups was significantly more sore. When they went in and they demolished their chest and did 10 sets of chest or whatever it is, they came out really, really sore. However, the group that ended up touching on the muscle groups just a little bit every day ended up having virtually no soreness. They didn't really feel pain at all. But here's where it gets crazy. At the end of the study, what they found was that there was no difference between the two groups in terms of their gains. Like they both had the same results. So whether they ended up training one muscle group per day or all their muscle groups per day, they ended up having the same strength and size gains. This is phenomenal stuff because this proves that the group that ended up obliterating themselves and getting super sore didn't have any better results than those that just touched on the muscle groups a little bit at a time. See, there's different stressors that we have to take into consideration. But maybe the post-workout delayed onset muscle soreness pain stress is not what we should be focusing on. You see, if you go into the gym and you focus on just blasting your chest, you're adapting to some level of stress, but it's localized at the chest, right? If you go to the gym and you're stressing your full body, you're adapting to a different kind of stress, a different kind of hormonal stress, an enzymatic stress because you're taxing the whole body. So you see, it's not like it's a wimpier workout to not obliterate one body part. It's all about perception. In fact, I would argue that the systemic overload that you get is probably better with the full body workout. So at the end of the day, all you need to be focusing on doing is modulating inflammation so that your body can recover at its best regardless of what you're doing. But don't ever focus on soreness as your goal. All that is going to do at the end of the year is make it so you have less chances to train because you're going to be so sore. If your quads are so sore from doing squats that you're not able to do your cardio, I don't care who you are, you're not going to be as well-rounded of an athlete or a fit person as a person that has enough recovery to still get a good workout in either way. So as always, make sure you're keeping it locked in here. If you have ideas for other workout videos or exercise physiology videos, make sure you put them down in the comment section below so that we can review them and get to work on them. I'll see you in the next video.